Thanks to REM for sponsoring this video. If you're interested to learn more about the climate crisis and ways to offset your carbon footprint, then stick around to the end of the video. Also, quick announcement, the Queer Movie Podcast, which is a podcast that I co-host with my friend Jazza, is back for a second season, and it's now part of the Multitude Collective. I'll leave a link in the description, but basically it's a fun podcast about the best and worst of queer cinema that will be coming out every fortnight. The first episode of this season is already out, and it's about one of my favourite queer films of all time, so if that sounds of interest, then give it a listen. Hey, I'm Rowan, and today we're going to be talking about... Sorry, very unprofessional. I just need to... T one second. Hello? Yes, this is she. Who's speaking? Um, uh, oh, okay. Um, okay, yeah, no, I'll tell them. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. So it turns out the author's dead. I've done two previous iterations of this video in this series, so I know how this goes by now. Um, a lot of people, most people, they get what we're doing here, but some people just seem to take this as like a personal attack against their heterofragility. Um, and I wanna be the person who says, screw it, I'm gonna not think about them, I'm just gonna do my thing, but then half the time I'm writing these scripts and I enter a fugue state, like I'm like defending my PhD thesis or something and start finding actual evidence of what I'm saying. Basically, when I say a character should have been gay or bi or trans in this video, I'm not saying that the writers secretly sprinkled the queer agenda in that movie for me to sniff out like the rodent Sherlock Holmes. I'm saying it literally doesn't matter what they thought because the author is dead and all this matter is my interpretation. So as before, the following video is a heady mix of tongue in cheek fan theory and genuine queer analysis. And if this is your first time on my channel, welcome, hello, that pretty much sums up my whole deal so hopefully you'll stick around. This video is titled characters who should have been because some of this will be based on evidence but some of it will just be because I'm gay and I say so. Now because Disney now owns all stories have ever been told uh, I made the conscious decision to stick to just animated features and Disney Channel stuff for this video so don't go expecting the MCU or Star Wars to show up here although if those are of interest then you know feel free to let me know in the comments that you would like one of those in a future episode of this series. Gay dads. As always, I've split these fruity little fools into different categories to give this chaos some semblance of order. Now, in my Disney Olympics video, we discuss the secretive world of Disney's background lesbian mums, but I feel like there's a complementary category that needs some love in this video. So let's begin with gay dads. And I know that you know exactly who I'm gonna be starting with. Timon and Pumbaa. Listen, you don't always ask to become the adopted parents to an orphaned lion cub while out looking for snacks, but when you do, you say Akuna Matata and you roll with it. The first couple on our list are Timon Berkowitz and Pumbaa Smith, because yes, they have surnames, it turns out. Both of these two inseparable lads were ostracized from their own communities for being different, have almost zero interest in lady meerkats or warthogs, and love a bit of impromptu drag. They find a near-dead lion cub out in the desert and raise him as their own for years together as a delightful little family. So famously, Timon was played in the original movie by the gay acting icon Nathan Lane and subsequently replaced by Billy Eichner in the live action remake that wasn't at all live and was in fact just a more detailed cartoon. Another queer actor. He said that although he couldn't say Timon and Pumbaa were canonically gay, he played the character with a gay sensibility, um, whatever that means. And it's not just the OG Lion King feature film that backs this up in the TV show, in a rare moment of showing interest towards Lady Meerkats, Timon ultimately is shown to choose Pumba over Tatiana, his colony crush. In the episode Once Upon a Timon, Timon is given the chance to be welcomed back into his colony, given the key to the city and Tatiana's hand in marriage. But he'd have to leave Pumba behind and he can't bring himself to do that. He's shown a life of prosperous heterosexuality and refuses it in order to stick around with his warthog boyfriend. Jumba and Pleakley. Another duo who really came into their own in their respective post-movie TV show were Jumba and Pleakley from the Lilo and Stitch universe. Just two, you know, alien pals uh, living life together in Hawaii. After the events of the original, the pair of mismatched aliens move into Lilo's bedroom as our roommates and often appear in disguise as Lilo's uncle and aunt. Uh, they even get married in one episode in a ceremony paid for and attended by Pleakley's entire family and presided over by like an actual ordained minister. Yes, it might be for convoluted plot reasons, but getting married is very rarely the only solution to life's problems. It's just the one that they chose. In the Lilo and Stitch movie, Pleakley loves dressing in what we might consider to be drag, insisting that his disguise 
always be that of a human woman. So an equally valid reasoning here is that Pleakley is trans or non-binary or just generally vibing as an alien who doesn't necessarily have the same understanding of man and woman as we humans do. Please see my video about non-binary aliens for way more thoughts on this trope if you were interested. Cogsworth and Lumiere. Cogsworth and Lumiere are two servants who got turned into a candelabra and a clock respectively in Beauty and the Beast. It is truly a crime that these two weren't gay in the remake and they had that terrible, very gay moment from LeFou instead. These two bicker like an old married couple and get to act as stand-in dads to Belle when she's trapped in the castle, telling her to be their guest and calming the beast when he gets angry at her. Cogsworth was originally played by openly gay actor David Ogden Steers, and similarly, in McKellen played him in the reboot. The OG Cogsworth actor has said of the role, I enjoy working. And even though many have this idealistic belief that the entertainment industry and studios like Walt Disney are gay friendly, for the most part, they are, but that doesn't mean for them that business does not come first. It's a matter of economics. A lot of my income has been derived from voicing Disney and family programming. Essentially hinting at the reluctance of Disney to have openly gay characters, even as they use queer talent and as writers, composers and actors behind the scenes. Mike and Sully. So Mike and Sully are two mismatched and lovable monsters from Pixar's Monsters, Inc. who find themselves having to take care of a human child when she escapes into their world. Sully especially is a really good father figure to boo. And I really wish we could have had like two gay monster dads. Even Mike's reluctance would have played into the existing trope seen in movies like Up or Shrek with men resisting fatherhood at first. This isn't necessarily one with like actual textual evidence. I just think it would be neat. Although having said that, I do think that we could get a lot of mileage out of the whole monsters being in the closet joke itself. Um, and there are also already some great could be pushed into the romantic box moments in the film. So the ending of the film, for example, where Mike, like we find out that Mike has painstakingly sorted through the like hundreds, maybe thousands of pieces of Boo's shredded door and fix them to like make them into the original state so that Sully can still visit her. Like that just, it feels like something that husbands could do for each other, you know? Just the whole concept of Peter Pan. In this section, I'm gonna give a special mention to the queer family dynamic potential of Peter Pan, who incidentally, is almost always played by a woman on stage because why not? The idea of the Lost Boys having no desire to be part of a real nuclear family, instead creating a family that works for them, Love it, found family, classic. Honestly, if we wanted to get deep with it, it plays very well into the concept of like queer temporality. Peter experiencing time differently because he doesn't want traditional heterosexual milestones, nor does he experience them in the right order to become a man that society wants him to be, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You you get the vibe. You know, we could go there. Villains. I've spoken many times on this channel about the historic and current connection in media between queerness and villainy. So I'm not gonna rehash that all here, but just the dramatic like red string notice board connection basically goes, queerness was seen as bad, bad people are portrayed as villains in media, the Hays Code and censorship meant queer people couldn't be portrayed openly in media, so queer people were coded as villains, writers don't realise that history or just don't care and replicate queer vibes as villainous archetypes, and the cycle continues. I could include so many examples here that have been pointed out by countless media critics over the years, like Scar, Radcliffe, Hades, Jafar, King Candy, the list goes on and on. Effeminate men whose very nature is seen as suspicious, especially compared to the heteronormative hero. Sure, you could criticize Disney for doing this at all, but I say, commit to the bit, you cowards. Actually make your gay ass villains gay all the way. I fucking dare you. For this section, I've gone with like a kind of slightly out there example um, that I think doesn't get enough love or hate to pitch as a potential queer villain to you. Rattigan. Okay, so, if you don't know who Rattigan is, Rattigan is the antagonist in Disney's Sherlock Holmes Basil Baker Street adaptation. He and Basil, the great mouse detective, clearly have some history. And although I'm sure that we're meant to think it's just like the classic hero villain history, a small but strong subset of the internet is committed to the theory that they are in fact also exes. Considering the fact that Sherlock and Moriarty in like most adaptations have at least some support for their romantic tension amongst audiences, this, isn't that much of a surprise. Rattigan is always dressed in like a colorful cravat and it's very camp cigarette holder and this kind of upper class flamboyance that is a big element of the queer coded villain. There's this iconic moment where he has one of his henchmen killed for accidentally calling him a rat, which he is, because it speaks aloud the outsider status. 
something he considers shameful and to be hidden at all costs. His identity is plain to see for many, but it marks him apart as lesser than the normal mice around him. So this ruse to conceal it continues. Also, he has this harp solo interlude in his villain song where he just plays the harp and sings about Basil for a bit, like how much he hates him. And honestly, this little rat, like he protests too much. So halfway through the film, Rattigan devises this like complex killing machine to finally defeat Basil. And it involves playing a song that he wrote and recorded himself on a gramophone called Goodbye So Soon. And the lyrics are thus. You followed me, I followed you. We were like each other's shadows for a while. Now, as you see, this game is through. So although it hurts, I'll try to smile. As I say goodbye so soon, and isn't this a crime? We know by now that time knows how to fly. So here's goodbye, so soon you'll find your separate way. With time so short, I'll say so long and go so soon, goodbye. And then he like chuckles and gives us a little wave and goes, bye bye, Bezel. And I just think the drama of that line being delivered to a hated ex is very fun. And you know what? I did say that this was a villain section, but for the purpose of this video, Basil is also totally gay. He shows no interest in any of the hot lady mice during that bar scene and also displays terrible judgment in dating Rattigan, a dude who canonically does both bank robbery and orphan drowning, lesbian or asexual. So these next two will come as no surprise to anyone, I'm pretty sure. Basically what happens is that when you decide to not give your princess a male love interest, everyone's gonna assume that they're a lesbian or asexual. You see, Disney, you thought you did a modern feminism and instead you did a queer agenda, you silly little gooses. Elsa. So Elsa from Frozen, in contrast to her boy crazy sister Anna, is never shown to have any interest in romance. This combined with the metaphoric potential of a child who is forced to keep a part of herself a secret repressed deep inside of her, has led many to claim Elsa for the gays. Let It Go is an obvious coming out anthem about the joys of letting go of shame and letting your authentic self shine through. When the sequel rolled around, there was massive amounts of speculation when a new female character was introduced in the trailers, leading a lot of people to assume that it would be Elsa's long awaited girlfriend after so much support for it following the first movie. But no, uh, although a lot of people saw the potential for a romance between the two, the film itself didn't actually go there. Elsa decided to stay with the new characters in the forest by the end of the movie, and it doesn't take much to imagine how she might have decided to stay for the woman that she loved too in a version of the film that like actually explored that potential. And considering how ending up in romantic relationships is a seeming prerequisite for existing as a Disney princess, you could also argue that her total lack of interest is an implied indication that she isn't ever going to be interested at all, giving us a potential asexual and aromantic character too. Merida. In a very similar vein, we have the feisty princess Merida, who's set to be married off to one of the other clan's sons in Pixar's Brave. She rails against traditional gender roles and clothing, preferring archery and climbing in the wilds of Scotland to being a proper princess. Now, of course, you can say that this doesn't necessarily make her queer, right? But it doesn't necessarily make her automatically straight either. However, when taking into account the political climate of the film's release in 2012, the finale that includes like this princess giving an impassioned speech about wanting the freedom to marry who she wants on her own terms, the right to choose her own fate, no matter what tradition dictates is right, it feels very reminiscent of the equal marriage debate in the US at the time, where same gender couples were fighting to be seen as worthy of the rights and freedoms to marry the people that they loved that heterosexual people already had. I will, however, also put in a strong argument for Merida being a romantic asexual for many reasons, but the most important being that it would make her an arrow ace. By icons, Li Shang and Mulan. Okay, so these two have their own category because I mean, come on. Mulan tells the story of a woman who dresses as a man to take her ailing father's place in the Chinese Imperial Army. Spoiler alert, she saves all of China like a boss. She also ends up in a romantic relationship with her commander Li Shang, who fully thought that she was a dude for most of this movie. Mulan has this classic gender confusion many queer young people see themselves in. She has two whole songs about how she doesn't fit in as a girl, but she also doesn't fit in as a boy either. The stunning ballad reflection asking, when will my reflection show who I am inside? While disguised as a man, Mulan plays out the quintessential storyline of being in the closet, desperate to stay hidden and scared of the potential backlash to being outed. I feel like there was a lot of missing potential in the possible Li Shang Mulan romance pre her coming out as a girl. The implications are very much ignored in that classic Shakespearean tradition of setting up a queer as hell premise and then sticking your fingers in your ears until it gets to the very heterosexual ending. 
Gender is a fairy tale. This section is all about how gender is a mess and some Disney characters should have been trans or maybe like already are. Wally and Eve. So in the futuristic Pixar movie Wally, the titular robot is stuck on Earth cleaning up after humanity, after the entire population left the planet uninhabitable. He teams up with his fellow robot Eve to bring the humans back home. So technically, if you have ever referred to these two as like a boy and a girl robot, couple like you're basically also saying that they're already gay because the movie never confirms their gender identity so assuming that they are queer is just as valid as assuming that they're straight and like they're robots so they most likely don't you know have a gender but i know they clearly meant to be coded as a boy and a girl from their visual design to the choice of names but like why the cis and heteronormative status quo is the boring answer of course we're gonna make a boxy, dirty, trash collecting boy robot and a sleek, more high pitched voiced behavior correcting girl robot. And obviously they're going to fall in love. There's no reason why these two can't be non-binary, genderless robots in love. In fact, they basically already are. Remy. My boy Remy is trans. We're far enough into the video now that I'm just gonna say it full chest. Um, I read sexual dimorphism in rats, effects of early maternal separation and variable chronic stress on pituitary adrenal axis and behavior for this fucking video. I did not need to do that. Uh, but I, what I can say is that male rats are bigger than female rats. And therefore it isn't unreasonable to say that my son Remy, who is very much smaller than the other canonical boy rats, is a French cuisine master chef of a trans boy. Now Ratatouille, unlike a lot of other cartoons, does a great job of not giving the female animal characters like falsies and big mummy milkers. So at first it might seem like there are no lady rats in the movie, but online sleuths have spotted the size difference in characteristics of pretty much every type of real rat and concluded entirely fairly that I am right. There is no straight explanation for this. This section is all about characters whose queerness was just there for the taking. And I am taking it. Raya and the Hot Lesbian. Raya and the Hot Lesbian, or Raya and the Last Dragon as it is technically called, is a reasonably recent addition to this list. A Disney movie based in a fictional pan-Asian world once populated by dragons. When the dragons sacrifice themselves, humanity split into separate nations or factions, each turning against the other. There's like this magical orb that's the center of the story and a key to bringing the dragons back and has stayed for centuries with Raya's faction. As a child, Raya befriends Namari, the daughter of the leader of another faction. They bond over both being like massive of dragon fangirls and Rhea naively brings Namari to see the orb. Namari, conditioned by her faction to see the orb is rightfully theirs, betrays Rhea and conflict between the nations is sparked once more. The movie's plot sees them working against each other years later with Namari still dedicated to her family's cause. In the end, however, the world is saved in part by the decision to trust each other again. With this being a recent movie, a lot of people hoped that it would finally be the moment that Disney would commit to a queer lead. But um, not so much. The worst part is actress Kelly Marie Tran, who played Raya, was fully on board saying, I love their relationship. I was probably the first person to ship those characters, but also admitting it might get me in trouble for saying that, but whatever. Also, as I heavily hinted earlier in this video, Namari just looks super gay, to be honest. Like, um, the undercut, it's mm, incredible. And there's this <laughs> moment where Raya says, Hey there, Princess Undercut. Fancy meeting you here with this smirk on her face and like, the friends to enemies to lovers vibes are truly immaculate. Luca. I am not gonna waste any time on this. I made a whole video about it. Just go and watch that, to be honest. In conclusion, mermaids are gay, what can I say? Mal and Evie. We spoke earlier about the inherent queerness of villains and it turns out it's hereditary. Descendants is a wild ride of a movie musical franchise based on the teenage children of iconic Disney villains being allowed to attend mainstream school for the first time on the like magical good kingdom. I watched this one scene with Mal and Evie and you cannot tell me there is a heterosexual explanation for this. It's this song called The Space Between and it gives very like Elphaba Glinda energy from Wicked when they're about to like part in Defying Gravity, which is very sapphic to put it lightly. Here are some of the lyrics. And you can find me in the space between where two worlds come to meet. I'll never be out of reach cause you're part of me. So you can find me in the space between. You'll never be alone, no matter where you go. We can meet in the space between. There are no words left to say. We know you've got to find your place, but this is not the end. You're part of who I am. Even if we're worlds apart, you're still in my heart. It will always be you and me. Like the daughter of Maleficent and the daughter of the evil queen in a friends to girlfriends romance instead of being foisted off onto boring boys. You know it makes sense. 
The vibes. You can't assume someone's sexuality or gender just by looking at them. A haircut or a piece of clothing cannot inherently be gay. We should support people of all identities being able to play around and express themselves with their presentation without it meaning anything. However, the lesbian cat captain from Treasure Planet. I didn't even have anything to say here. I just think that if you fancied her as a child, you're a lesbian now and like that kind of power can't be ignored. Cusco. He's just giving queer emperor vibes. You know, the only time we see him interact with women is when he's dismissing them as potential partners out of hand one after another, like in quick succession. Plus there's that classic gag where he dresses as a woman as a disguise. Disney loves a bit of drag as disguise until further notice. Or like Disney actually includes canonical LGBTQ plus characters in their films. Every character they make dress in drag for a bit is now queer. Kelsey. We all know Ryan from High School Musical is gay. I included him and Chad in a previous video in this series, but I would be doing us all a disservice if I did not include the character that they weirdly try to use as his beard in the movies, Kelsey. Something about all those hats really spoke to me. Um, I just distinctly remember me and my friends Googling the actress in real life who played her and being like, uh, gulp, oh no, <laughs> she's hot. I just the very fact that they tried to no homo Kelsey and Ryan by having them go to prom together, truly wild to me and in my mind only made them gayer and stronger because it was real like gay lesbian solidarity you know spinelli truly if you do not see this there is nothing i can do for you disney channel injustices okay so many people including me did not have disney channel growing up but it has come to my attention as an adult that that channel was a cesspool of homosexual potential i have selected just three standout examples for you Maddie and London. We're starting off this section with the example that has the, like, the least actual grounding in the show itself. So Sweet Life of Zack and Cody technically focuses on the escapades of twins Zack and Cody while living in the Tepton Hotel. But for the purposes of this video, we are focusing on Maddie Fitzpatrick, who runs the hotel candy counter. You know, the normal hotel candy counter that all hotels have. And London, whose father owns all the Tiptons. So, um... I guess there was that scene where London thought Maddie told her to strip and just started like going with it and getting undressed in front of her. Um, and there was also the episode where they had to be lesbian parents to a fake baby doll for class and they got super into it. And Maddie said, I'm 16. I've never even kissed a boy. Like she's super proud of it. Um, ultimately, I just think that this show would have been better with the will they won't their love story between a plucky and outspoken candy counter worker and a ditzy hotel heiress. Opposites attract, you know? Cadet Kelly. Okay, so if you aren't familiar, in Cadet Kelly, this artsy kid played by Hilary Duff has to go to military school when her mum marries an army person. She comes into kind of conflict with Cadet Stone, but of course, they have to work together in Drill Team. Another YouTuber has made a single video that's an hour long about how this movie is gay as hell. So all I'm going to say here is one, her blanket is a pride flag that she is forced to hide in military school. Two, there are terrible semi-homoerotic military dance routines and yes plural there are more than one and three they had to include like a bland as hell love interest as a distraction from how obviously gay it was is this movie military propaganda for kids yes is it also the best lesbian story ever told no that award of course goes to the background lesbian mums in any pixar movie but it is a damn close thing miley and lily and finally, we couldn't leave out Miley Cyrus. I mean, Stuart. Um, so in case you have been living under a rock or are so new and youthful that you weren't alive when this show was on air, Hannah Montana is about this girl from the South who moves to California and lives a double life as a normal girl, Miley, and a superstar, Hannah Montana. The show's central conflict comes from Miley being like not out as Hannah Montana and finding an authentic balance between the different sides of herself. Lily is her best friend who loves skateboarding and dresses like this, including this hat last seen on confirmed lesbian Kelsey from High School Musical. Lily doesn't like to express herself in a hyper feminine way and her gender presentation is something that is often a conflict on the show. This skateboard, the tomboy chic, it's all coming together. Do we not think that the themes of leading a double life, hiding who you really are, finding your authentic self, wearing hats, would have paired exquisitely with a queer protagonist. In the pilot episode, Miley comes out while in a literal closet as Hannah Montana, and one of her coming outs is in response to her male friend having a crush on Hannah. She literally has to come out in response to unwanted male attention. I mean. Her song, The Best of Both Worlds, is clearly a bisexual bop, if ever I heard one. And the lyrics to The Other Side of Me include, Don't wanna hide, just wanna fit in. Sometimes it's harder than it seems. 
If you could see the other side of me, I'm just like anybody else. Can't you tell? I hold the key to both realities. The girl that I want you to know. You can see this, right? There are these moments in the show that really emphasize the kind of takeaway message of being authentic to yourself. And it feels like to have that message given to a queer tween icon, especially one played by an actual queer teen whose life was so entwined with the show Miley Cyrus, it would have been pretty wonderful for young people to see. Like her dad says this. Well, I'm proud of you, honey, for trying to make all your fans happy. But since you can't do that, the one that you really need to make happy is you. And you can just see that being the line that he says after an episode where she decides whether or not she's going to come out as gay as Hannah Montana. In conclusion, this video is obviously like a fun joke in a lot of ways, but I think it's pretty telling that there's a popular Tumblr, LGBT Disney headcanons, that is literally run and was created by a group of teenagers. Clearly there's a desire for this representation, not just from adults who feel that they would have benefited from it as children, but from actual children as well. The fact that we're still talking about first gay characters is frankly ridiculous. And the fact that there will almost certainly have been people who looked at the title of this video and thought that it was unnecessary or wrong or even dangerous only serves to prove how needed this representation is. Disney is a powerhouse of storytelling that defines so many people's childhoods, what they value, what they dream of. And although everyone can learn from the stories of bravery and empathy that straight characters go through, they could just as easily learn those from queer characters. And it would have the added benefit of giving young queer and questioning people the support and validation of seeing themselves in an on-screen hero. I would love to hear your queer Disney theories in the comments. And if you would like to help support me making videos like this one, then I will leave a link to my Patreon in the description as well. Thanks again to today's sponsor, Ren, that I am so excited to be working with for a second time. Ren is a website that helps you calculate your carbon footprint and then gives you a way to offset it by funding projects like planting trees and protecting rainforests. You basically answer some questions about your lifestyle and Ren will show you what your individual carbon footprint is and ways you can help reduce it. And because reducing your carbon footprint to zero is basically impossible, you can also offset what you have left. When you sign up to make a monthly contribution to offset your carbon footprint, you receive updates from the tree planting, rainforest protection, and other projects you support, and you get to see the trees you planted and what your money is being spent on. If you're wondering about ways that you can help fight the climate crisis, I know it can seem overwhelming. This is just one way that you can start helping today. And you can also look at other ways to help, like pushing for wider government action at Ren.co. I've partnered with Ren to protect five extra acres of rainforest for the first hundred people who sign up using my referral link. So check the link out in the description. We're done guys. And for the people who have stuck around to the end of this video, I've started to do little treats for people who stick around until the very end. And this one is a doozy because I have kittens now. I realized I don't think I had them last time I did a video. So I'm gonna, if they've been locked in the other room, I'm gonna go and get them so you get to see them. This is Ichabod. Hi, say hi. Oh, you're so beautiful, hi. So he is extremely small and very cute. His name is Ichabod. This is Seppi. Oh, there you go. Hi. Hi, baby. Hi. This is her. So those are the kitties. They're extremely cute because I would be absolutely insufferable on my main Instagram and only take pictures of them. I've made them their own account if you would like to follow along with their escapades. You can do so. I'll, I guess, leave the link in the description.